Um, I'd like to take this time to uh, introduce the uh, speaker, uh, James Davis. He is the uh, Senior Infection Prevention Analysis from the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority. And he, and he wrote the excellent uh, article on surgical site infection prevention. Thank you very much uh, for, for the introduction, Kevin. I just want to point out, too, that you know, nothing that uh, we do with the authorities is a solo effort. Uh, with this collaborative, what we did was um, work with the, the uh, Hospital Association of Pennsylvania, um, and I actually had three co-authors, and this work was done uh, through uh, the HEN uh, partnership. Uh, so basically what I have to say is the analyses upon which this publication is based were in part funded, performed on the contract number HHSN 500-2012-0002C entitled Hospital Engagement Contractor for Partnership for Patients Initiative, which is essentially the HEN contracts and the Partnership for Patients. Uh, this slide is just acknowledging uh, my co-authors, uh, Mary Catanzano, who I believe is on the call, Claire Edelmeyer, uh, and Linda Martin, who are all uh, representatives of HAP. Uh, and myself, who uh, represents the Patient Safety Authority. So a little background on the authority. Uh, we have an Act 52 and an Act 13 in Pennsylvania. It's Chapters 3 and 4 of the MCARE Act. It essentially set up the Patient Safety Authority, which is the independent state agency that is responsible for receiving uh, all the mandatory reporting on HAIs and other incidents and events within the state from acute care and long-term care, but we are not regulatory. I'm going to stress that. So we are non-regulatory. We have a dedicated funding stream uh, of which the hospitals and nursing homes contribute to us so we can do our work. Uh, we have an 11-member uh, board that's appointed by the governor of General Assembly, but like I said, we're an independent state agency. Uh, we have a, we, we contract, the authority contracts with other entities like Equity Institute, uh, HAP, and um, the uh, ISMP, which is the Institute for Safe Medication Practices, to analyze and evaluate reports of serious events and incidents and identify epidemiologic trends in all of the data, and that helps guide our educational offerings, which are free to the public. Uh, advice and issue recommendations is mainly what we do. We look at the data and um, advise and address trends and recommend improvements in healthcare uh, practices mainly through our, our main voice, which is the advisory. So the, the patient safety advisories are our main output, which is a peer-reviewed journal. And we focus on education, collaboration, and guidance. A lot of our activities, uh, like I mentioned, uh, our goal is to improve patient safety through data analysis and collaboration. In December 2013, um, we were able to notice uh, a decrease, basically, I'm sorry, in, in December 2013, we actually reached in our database over two million events, which you know sounds bad, but it's actually good because it gives us something to look at, something to analyze, and something to act on. And because we're non-punitive and non-regulatory, it's pretty much a good model uh, from a patient safety organization standpoint that the facilities aren't afraid to report to us the incidents and events, so we can actually act on them and they're not afraid of being penalized and we can educate them and help them. And through those efforts, between 2008 and 2013, we've actually seen a 12% decline in serious event reports. Um, efforts to improve patient safety continue through collaborations like this one with the Hospital Health System Association of Pennsylvania and other organizations uh, you know, like HealthWatch, uh, to be honest with you. So for this work, essentially uh, what we did was we wanted to look at um, how we can impact surgical site infection. And to guide our efforts, we focused on, through our database, what were the you know, common organisms um, for a selected group. And the group we were looking at were elective procedures, uh, and, and we also wanted to target um, those infections that happened to clean wounds. So in other words, they weren't your traumas with, you know, you didn't slide off a motorcycle and have dirt and pebbles in your wound. Um, you had a pretty much like an appendectomy where it's a scheduled procedure in most cases, or at least it's planned, um, perhaps a gallbladder removal, something like that, where it's a, it's a fresh clean incision that shouldn't technically get infected um, and, and have an elective procedure. And that, what, what that did was give us time to work with the patient and prep them, per se, and I'll get into those details. But what you see in front of you is actually from uh, <coughs> NHSN which is the National Healthcare Safety Network administered by the CDC that we have access to. They, all, all hospitals in Pennsylvania have conferred rights to us so we can view their data. 
And what we did from an analysis standpoint was look at, um, for 2010, all the infection classes and the number of MRSA, the percent actually of total infections and the percent, not only uh, resistant staph aureus, but susceptible staph aureus. Because we just wanted to target, and well, actually we wanted to target something we can act on and something that people were familiar with as far as tracking and surveillance. So it's one of the reasons we, we chose staph aureus in general. And the, the, the uh, what we designed as far as uh, an intervention targeted both types of organisms. As you can see, Staph aureus um, is, in most cases, when it comes to infection, because it's commensal, uh, it can be as serious as, as uh, resistant Staph aureus. Some people underplay the, the significance of just Staph aureus in general, whether it be resistant or not. So what we tried to do, uh, we gave these uh, procedure types to the hospitals to take a look at their own data, because this was the state aggregate data. And they came back to us and we essentially let them pick what infections that they thought they could have the most impact on from a surgical uh, site infection standpoint. Now, here we target staph aureus, but because of the design of the intervention, we felt that although we're tracking staph aureus as an outcome metric, that other organisms uh, that were opportunistic pathogens like VRE and things could technically be covered by our intervention. But we did use staph aureus as our outcome measure. So screening and decolonization, basically an overview of um, the, the intervention that we presented in the paper was we would do perioperative screening of the active surgical patient, like I mentioned, uh, and that will be performed via the anterior nares for the presence of staph aureus and, uh, I'm sorry, resistant staph aureus and susceptible staph aureus. We chose the anterior nares uh, as uh, a way that the facilities could do it cheaply and simply. Um, again, when we're design, designing interventions for multiple facilities, we have to keep things in mind that, you know, ideally is that the best spot? Technically, it's, it's okay, but, you know, uh, post uh you know, or subglottic is actually more exact, but that's uncomfortable for the patient and hard to do right. So we went with anterior nares just uh, to keep it simple. The patients were either to date daily with 4% chlorhexidine glucanate or 2% uh, CH2 clos the night before in the morning uh, of the day of surgery. Uh, again, uh, it was a range of products, whether it be a prepared cloth or hibiclens, um, not that I'm advocating for a brand, but we basically let the patients in the hospitals kind of dictate what type of decolonization they would have to do because of cost and availability. So patients who were screened positive for either susceptible or resistant staff, they would apply the near person 2% uh, nasal two times a day for about five days prior to surgery. Uh, we also let uh, certain facilities and uh, the leeway to use the betadine product um, if the ID physicians were afraid about resistance patterns, which we were concerned about too. And I'll stress that any time you go with the decolonization uh, protocol, that you should be looking for resistance patterns, and if that is to develop, it needs to be addressed. So always be sensitive to resistance patterns when you're doing active decolonization. Um, patients are also to receive a day of surgery cleansing of the surgical site, 4% CHG, applied by the healthcare worker, or, like I said, the 2% cost. That's not done as the surgical prep. That was done pre-op in a holding area or in the in the pre-OR uh, pre area. Patients are also to receive this regular surgical prepping uh, in the operating room uh, suite with the alcohol-based product um, designated as the surgical skin preparation. Now, as I say that, you know, of course, because of the sustained kill of CHG, we felt that that would be optimal, but we also let facilities um, choose other products as long as it's alcohol-based and provided um, evidence-based uh, kill of, of surgical, uh, I'm sorry, of uh, it was an accepted surgical prep. So the iota fours, your proton iodines, uh, your alcohol combination products, and the CHG alcohol product as well. So this is, a, that was just basically an overview. This intervention is unique because it actually uh, starts when the patient understands or knows that they need surgery. So it actually starts with the office visit. So in most cases, it was a planned procedure, um, and based on the facility's acceptance, they were eligible for the decolonization intervention. So, um, like I said, elective non-emerging cases to make it easier. 
The patient education, of course, needs to be provided. They understand and they reiterate back to uh, us that they are an active participant in their care. So we're assigning a little bit of accountability to the patient. It also makes it a little more serious to the patient that they can do something to help care for themselves versus the healthcare workers you know, trying to manage this very difficult infection uh, to prevent. The patient will be screened uh, for staph aureus, um, basically pre-emission testing policy. Uh, written uh, patient education materials are also provided. It's one thing to say it verbally to the patient and they're stressed out about surgery, so we also want to give it to them in a written format so they have something to look at at home and call us back with questions. So pre-admission, um, the appointment is often scheduled you know, at least seven days before surgery. Sometimes it was um, not that far out, but however the facility wanted to address it to be able to get these materials and get the patient oriented with the, uh, the decolonization protocols. So pre-admission or pre-op visit, um, like I said, scheduled ahead of time. The patient will be informed by phone of the screening results. So this is after the initial visit, so they'll know. They'll get the phone call whether the result was positive or negative. They'll get education again, both written and verbal, um, related to the screening results. So if you screen negative, you're pretty much good to go. If you screen positive, positive staph aureus or, or resistant staph aureus, you were assigned the decolonization protocol. Um, and then again, written uh, and verbal uh, discussion of the protocol data collection and the expectations of the patient, which is key here, um, that they would have to do, uh, you know, the nasal mucus and, and whatever uh, bathing that we would have them do uh, several days before surgery. So we would also provide them any prescriptions or other materials uh, that they needed to have called in or, or most, some hospitals actually provided them with uh, samples, uh, you know, if they were available. If MRSA positive, um, we would actually consult with infection prevention to make sure that nothing was um, left missed and involve ID physicians as well if, if that was the case, with, if it was a persistent infection or a long-term infection uh, or colonization, excuse me, or both. Uh, the patient has uh, an overall responsibility, like I mentioned. They have to comply with the protocol. And we took a big leap of faith on this one, but we were um, uh, very impressed with the level of engagement that we have from the patients and the facilities. And the patient uh, at all times would have to have access to professionals if questions arise. So we, the facilities provide them with contact information for you know, nurses, uh, of course, the physician, and any eye, uh, infection prevention uh, professionals that would uh, make sense for them to have contact with. Um, you know, the key here is, you know, because of cost, because of geography, whatever, they, they need to have access to the colonization supplies. Cost could be an issue when you look at an intervention like this because we are saying, you know, decolonization uh, cloth with the CH2 or what have you, and also prescriptions for things like mirror Pearson. So, uh, you know, there is cost assigned to this, whether the facility assumes those costs or whether it's passed on to the patient, there's still things to consider. Um, like I said, some, some facilities provided uh, the uh, decolonization supplies and some didn't, and the patients had to do it. Um, again, we stress with the patients their role, the importance of their compliance, the, the perceived risk uh, with not following uh, the decolonization protocol, pretty much, you know, uh, informed consent, pretty much. Uh, and we were impressed with the amount of uh, participation and, and dedication we had from the patients as well. And if the patient was unable to comply for any reason, you know, we would consult with uh, family members or other services. Silly things pop up when you design an intervention, per se, maybe you're having neck surgery and you can't lift your arms to uh, decolonize your, your skin on the back of your neck with hip cleanse because it hurts. So we would look at uh, social considerations and family issues uh, if the surgical site was not able, not, not able to be cleansed by the patient. So things do pop up that you need to address that unfortunately doesn't really pop up when you write up a paper, but there are the little details. During the acute care uh, phase, um, during the admission, the patient uh, compliance, we had compliance data forms that the patient actually tracked themselves and delivered to us uh, during the admission process, and they were forwarded out to whatever department the uh, facility chose, whether it was the infection prevention department or the patient's physician, however they track the compliance. And the application of the infection control measures by staff, so if they did come in with MRSA and the staff and the facility had a, uh, a contact precautions protocol like many do in Pennsylvania, 
that would be instituted uh, to keep not only the patient safe, but other patients and the staff as well. And they would have the day of surgery preoperative CHC wipe of the surgical site done by the healthcare worker in the holding area pre-op. And then the screening results were also communicated with any um, department that would have a need to know, uh, just from a, a standard precaution standpoint and a contact precaution standpoint. Once in the operating room, the infection control measures, of course, were maintained. Like I said, contact precautions, if you were marks are positive. Operating room decolonization checklists. So we developed a checklist for the healthcare worker in the OR to make sure that the decolonization protocol was followed and a way to double check. And that checklist would have been forwarded to the appropriate department. Like I said, either the infection prevention department or uh, whatever, whatever the department was managing the protocols for us. The patient surgical site was prepped in the surgical suite with the alcohol-based skin surgical prep that I mentioned earlier in the overview. Um, so whatever the facility was accustomed to using um, for their LR prep was, was used. And then the immediate preoperative incision skin prep, and this is very important, was allowed to dry prior to procedure start. And we stress that uh, very often and, and very loudly with the physicians and the OR staff that that was key in any type of skin prep that it would be allowed to try. So the next slide is essentially the results. Um, I, I like the, uh, you know, this graph actually, I have to give credit out to our graphics department, the authority, because they added in the SIR trend lines, which makes it pretty easy to see um, the overall trend when you're looking at a, a table like this. But you can see in most of the procedures, um, we had some pretty significant um, declines. So, you know, uh, we'll discuss the results in a little bit, but things that stand out to me are the age pros, uh, the, the hip repairs and the knee repairs. That arena uh, in ortho surgery has been doing preoperative decolonization for a long time, uh, as well as the cardiac uh, surgeries, the, the, the bypass grafts and, and, and that type of surgery. They've been doing it for a long, long time, and we still were able to realize reductions uh, in, in the ortho realm. In the cardiac realm, the results were kind of flat uh, over time. And we were questioning as to whether or not in that realm in particular that maybe everything was being done that could be done from a decolonization standpoint. But we found that the, that the ortho uh, replacement surgeries were interesting that there was still further reduction to be had there for the most part. But in other areas uh, that we weren't expecting, things like uh, colon procedures and things like laminectomies showed pretty good decreases over time, um, which we were very, very happy with because they have not been addressed in the literature uh, often, if at all. So the baseline SIRs in the next slide, we'll talk about that. The baseline SIR aggregates in 2010 and 11 were 1.2 and 1.1, pretty much. Uh, and the SIR aggregates post-intervention in 2012 and 2013 were uh, 0.79 and 0.73. Uh, so pretty decent reductions when we talk about SIRs and, and, and what we would expect being that an SIR above one isn't too good and the SIR, anything with an SIR below one is, is actually significant. Uh, the various reductions that we saw in SIR from baseline to the end of 2013 were essentially in the colon procedures, C-sections, hip replacement, knee replacements, and laminectomy, and we included the NHSN codes, uh, if you wanted to reference those in any of the NHSN literature. Uh, reductions, like I noted uh, before, HPRO, KPRO, you know, despite the fact that, like I mentioned, the orthopedic literature is chock full of screening and decolonization successful protocols, we were happy to see that we could reduce it further. Um, and then, you know, this intervention in, in most cases uh, stretches out what we typically consider, typically consider decolonization processes, uh, which we thought was interesting that would require, you know, further investigation. The majority of our facilities probably had a decolonization period between maybe two and five days, mostly averaging at about three, where, you know, the question still remains, what's the optimal time? Is it five days? Do you decolonize, decolonize, do you culture negative? We didn't take the approach where you decolonize to you culture negative. Um, we just said, okay, any decolonization is better than none, and, and took that aspect and based our uh, predictions about time length on the current literature, but no one to my knowledge has actually answered the, the best way to go about it. So we found it, you know, interesting that without that, decolonization to negative, that we were still able to realize a significant reduction in um, MRSA and staph aureus uh, resistant and, and, and uh, susceptible staph aureus SSI. 
Um, what I did for you guys, in case uh, you haven't seen the article or you would like the article, I provided both the reference and the direct link out to the advisory uh, so you can um, look at the uh, article in, in detail. Uh, this talk basically covered the high-level highlights. Um, the article goes into, into detail about the intervention, about how things were structured from an intervention uh, plus uh, a monitoring and metric standpoint, uh, the role of uh, or my HAP colleagues that were very interactive in uh, having coaching calls and visits and things like that that actually kind of drove uh, the facility participation. Um, and again, you know, uh, without the hospital engagement network, I don't think any of this work would have been done, uh, but I do think it adds to the body of the literature out there uh, about colonization, uh, decolonization, and, uh, you know, active screening and, and you know, it's, it's, I'm proud of this study because it wasn't funded by any manufacturers. It was pretty much, you know, funded by the government and we had free reign when it came to designing our intervention, based it in practical science and common sense and uh, realized some pretty decent reductions in preventable HI, especially due to staph aureus and, uh, you know, MRSA. So, you know, hopefully, this will spark further research into, like I said, optimal timing of decolonization and uh, maybe even some development of different products uh, that will uh, sustain increased dwell time killing uh, of, of organisms at the commensal level. So uh, at that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm finished up. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to entertain those.